professional learning session. Can you please turn and talk on the guiding question? How can we use science to encourage students' wonder and curiosity in nature? I think observation is a huge part of curiosity. I think everybody wants to uncover something and figure out how it works. I think authenticity can also be created when the students are uh, investigating their own question. So we have a science framework that talks about curiosity. Whee! Not everybody's going to become a scientist, but you can, we can all enjoy the natural world with a little bit of a science perspective, but we can also be better citizens by being able to think critically better and to be able to talk and argue politely and using evidence better. So one way to engage students in the outdoors, and you've heard this before already, is through nature mysteries. So we're going to do an activity. This is a student activity. So what we need is two circles. The inner circle will be sitting or on their knees, the outer circle standing, same amount of people in each circle. Go. Right here. This is um, NSI, Nature Scene Investigators activity. I use it primarily as a tone set at the beginning of my trail experiences. And then occasionally I'll use it if I find something really interesting on trail. I'm going to bring out an object and I'm going to set it in the center of the circle here. When I put it there, people in the inner circle, your main job is to say observations. People in the outer circle, your main job is to ask questions. And people in the inner circle, feel free to get up really close. Can you grab how many colors can you see? Go ahead and call them out, people in the inner circle. That? See blue and purple. Some brown and some black. Lots of shades. Some reds. reds. Some white. There's a hole. There's holes, yeah. There's holes in there. See through the hole. So, Don, do you see the holes? Green micro. Inner circle, switch to the outer circle. Outer circle, switch in. So both inner circle and outer circle make observations. And anybody can ask questions too. Oh, yeah. What's wrong? It's like a rubber chicken. Is it the same texture at the top? Is yeah. down? What do you think that thing is attaching the two sections? Let's switch over to making explanations. But it has to be an evidence-based explanation. It came from the ocean, so that hard shell protects it from waves. So how about those holes that we have in there? Can anybody make an explanation for those holes that you were looking at a little bit ago? Some, maybe something bored it, bored into it, or ate it, or because it's like by bored you mean like drilled? Like, yeah, or I don't know. Especially I know since, that there especially are other since critters that that this that one like doesn't have the calcium. Hole. Maybe something is digging into it to eat the shell itself. Yeah, maybe. Would anybody like to add to her explanation or come up with a different explanation or a different angle? Well, it could be yeah. suck the inside out. Yeah. Say more. Ah, uh, they have a proboscis or something that drills into there, and then like a like a spider, and maybe put something inside and turns it into a liquid and sucks the inside so out. Think, so let's switch over to something that new now, and that is we're going to make connections about this. Anything that you, if you've seen something like this before, if you heard something about it, or seen it in books or in a video or something, or if it reminds you of something from somewhere else in the world, any of those sorts of connections, go ahead and say them. But if you say something like I think that that's a such and such. You need to cite your source. You need to say, I saw that in a Nova video or something like that. I oh, ate okay. one of those at a restaurant yeah. and the menu called it a mussel. We're about to head out on a hike right now. And what you guys just did right there, tackling this mystery like that, that's what we're going to do the rest of the day. So I want you to try and find really interesting things like you did. You found all kinds of cool things. When you find cool things, don't just go, whoa, cool. Don't just stop there. Make your observations about it. Ask questions about it and then come up with explanations, talking to other people around you. And you can also say things that you've heard about it before too. But if you do, remember to always cite your source. It's a little different when I do this with adults than with kids. With kids, I have to do more coaching. One of the things to do is say, Daksha says, I see such and such in there. And then I say, do you see the same thing, Jess? Check it out. Lots of, can you confirm that? And that works especially well with the kids who are more reluctant to speak because it's a really comfortable question. Does it look blue to you? No, it doesn't look blue. It does look blue. It's really easy for them and it gets them engaged. So I'm constantly trying to ask questions to get people, everybody involved, but also trying to provoke some discussion. Do you agree with that? Is that what you saw? Now, what do you think about that explanation? So I use this as a coaching session, a language coaching session, science academic language coaching session too, but it's a riveting coaching session. And I find that, that those 15 minutes that I spent at the beginning of the hike pays off for the rest of the experience. I think the first thing is, right when you start, Kevin sets it up as I want you to describe your observations. 
So if the kid goes in, oh, well, that's a, you know, yeah. like, whoa, 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 hold, just hold that for a little bit. We'll get there. We want to know what you're observing right now. I've seen tens of thousands of pieces of, of kelp plants growing on mussels, and I never get tired of looking at them under a hand lens. So if I'm focused on the observation, it really is different than focusing on my prior knowledge, right? It's mm -hmm. not like I'm not getting to do something, it's that I am getting to do the other thing. What are the benefits of doing an activity like NSI? I think it's a very nice, um, non-formal, non-intimidating way to get them to start thinking and speaking like scientists. Yeah. They're using evidence, they're doing it, um, they're using evidence to come up with explanations, questions first and then explanations in a very non-threatening way. You're in a circle, no one's staring at you, everyone's staring down into the middle. <clears throat> Um, I think it's a, a safe environment to start practicing those skills. It introduces at an early age, and, I mean early time in the class, that you're honest, you're uh, vulnerable to, this, uh, to the kids, that you don't know everything. You introduce skills that you had the chance for the rest of the time you're with them to refine and, and help them get better at. And this may have been said, but it gives them ownership over, over the hike. It's not just my hike that I'm taking you on, but it's their hike. And it does give ownership, and I love that. I was talking to um, Don about how I'm such that, oh yeah, this is this, this is this, this is this type of person. And it's just made me realize I need to stop doing that. So why don't you, for the next few minutes, just go ahead and make observations, ask questions, come up with explanations, cite sources if, if you bring up other connections. Okay, let's fan out for at least five minutes. I think that's part of the kelp. Oh look, this is that weird coralline algae stuff. Tell me what you think makes it look like a worm case. Yeah, cool. So I think because of this round shape and sort of this hard covering. Uh -huh. So you have to find somebody different right now and tell them about your exploration, your explanation, all that sort of stuff. So Shane like ripped it open with her fingernails and it's just like totally hollow. We're looking at this mm -hmm. and we're trying to figure out what was going on here? So, like if it that was an, that was inquiry fever. Um, again, when I set kids off for inquiry fever, they have choice. So the NSI sets them up with the tools, and then I give them choice, and then they. Um, I've had kids say things like, "We get to do this," you know. Oh my God, I feel like a scientist. Oh, those sorts of things. It's exciting. Each student's gonna, I, I is just going to go to a different thing that they have a question about a mystery. You've got to have inquiry mindset and skills, and this activity is designed to set them up with that. You've got to have permission and encouragement. They have to feel like this is an acceptable behavior, both to be wandering around, making discoveries, but also to be saying, this is what I think my explanation is. You know, that not every context will people feel comfortable doing that. And then interesting stuff, ideas. I've seen people try to do NSI with something that's not very mysterious, and I've seen it not go so well. What might be some challenges to leading an activity like this? In the, the time that any individual participant uh, will, will want to spend on the activity, and it's probably going to vary. For that reason, I move it pretty quick. I don't wait until people are tired of making observations. When they're right in the thick of being excited about making observations, I go, okay, now switch. It seems so simple and like Kevin's not really hardly even doing anything. We're doing all the work, but it's, it's subtle um, and nuanced, but not simple mm -hmm. to, to create the context and the atmosphere for kids to start asking and to insert the right follow up question. Tell me more about that. Does anybody else see that? All those little things, those little prompts are the bridges that keep the the discussion going, and not every naturalist is good at that the first couple of times they do it. And what I'm telling naturalists now is, don't start off with this. Start off with, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of. The fact that it doesn't have explanations in it makes it a little bit simpler. Um, and I also say, do some discussion activities with your kids. Start off with paired discussions. Work up to smaller group discussions. Work up to large group discussions. But if you have those skills, it's pretty awesome. This is dialogue from two girls that just became passionate nature scientists on one of our hikes.
for folks who are struggling with language, this is like the perfect context for them. If you talk to English language learner researchers, they talk about how um, it needs to be, they need to be in a context rich environment. Um, saying, what color is that? Just having to describe things, what's the, the texture, what does it feel like? It's very language based. So we have a, another quote coming up here, a Max Planck quote. A new scientific truth does not triumph by convincing opponents and making them see the light, but rather because its opponents eventually die and a new generation grows up that is familiar with it. <laughs> <laughs> but that humility, that humble language of science is often misinterpreted pretty famously with people around climate science. So that's part of the reason that the framework and we are really ex interested in teaching about how science works and how, you th how the process works so that the general public, when they hear a science piece of science information, don't hold it, give it the same weight as somebody with a big loud mouth on a talk show saying something. There's a whole process to it. Not all evidence is equal. You'll find that some kids will say, my evidence is this, and it's the this flimsiest piece of idea you could possibly imagine. And then somebody else has this granite batholith type piece of evidence, and they're being given equal weight. And that's not really fair. So we need to have ways to evaluate evidence. The three things we're going to evaluate evidence on are the quantity of evidence, the size of assumptions, and the quality of source. Let's start off with the quantity of evidence. Something that's been observed by one person one time is generally not as strong as something that's been observed by a bunch of people a bunch of times. So I've got some cards that I want you to, to sort. The question that I want you to use these cards for is, are cheetah predators of wildebeest? Put them in order. Which ones seem like there's, it's, uh, it's harder to connect it with, uh, with the explanation, the evidence with the explanation, like it's most distant? And which ones seem like, that is so close. It's like, it, it's harder to argue away. Can we agree that this is pretty direct? I would say no. See it? This one is I would say that. We don't direct. know it that it actually killed it. It may just be scavenging on it. Yeah. Yeah. I would say that just, this is bigger yeah. evidence of predator than area. even that one, because yeah, they're chasing and running, but they, an interesting. in reality it could be that they're running mm -hmm. from a big noise. Yeah. Everybody gather around this group right over here, please. One of the ways I do describe this with kids is which one of these pieces of evidence leaves the least doubt in your mind? This one right here where the cheetah's eating, mm -hmm. that we thought that was the strongest evidence. I mean, the one all the way at the front, <laughs> I mean, they could just be having a powwow. <laughs> 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 you don't see them eating. <laughs> Sometimes I just simplify it too, to which one seems like the strongest or the least strong evidence, just to re even simplify it more. What would be the ideal evidence that you would want to have to answer the question, is cheetah a predator of wildebeest. Watching it Watch happen. It. Video. Watching it happen. Another way of sorting evidence is on quality of source. I've got another card sorting activity for you on this. I'm not suggesting you do this on trail. You have a set of cards. On each card is some type of source. So what I'd like you to do is sort them into what you think is most trustworthy to what you think is least trustworthy. I put yeah. Wikipedia in the middle. I would, I mean, yeah. I think it's fiction Because you can, for citation. right, and you can check on how, whether you should believe it or not. Right. So do you have any questions about the way they categorize these things? Because I bet you, you categorize them probably similarly, but also differently. I would say we were uh, um, discussing politicians because, I mean, I mean, our tendency is to put them right down at the bottom, but to, uh, to be fair on them, they're in the line. I mean, they're being held accountable to a degree. I'm not, I mean, I'm not saying they go all the way to the, old feet, all the, way to the top. <laughs> I would say above advertisements and fiction. But well, we said the difference between like an uh, executive like President Obama or Angela Merkel is gonna, I'm gonna trust more than some representative from an interesting state that doesn't believe in science. Right. Mm. Yeah. Not the general. So you did do an entire <laughs> spectrum of politicians. Which they yeah. Yeah. Well, I was at politicians is like advertisement. It could be very true or it could be very skewed to yeah. follow what their point is. So what to get what they want. Yeah. 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 So and you might lay out a spectrum of I trust this politician most, and then there's probably somebody else who would do it the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
no, half the country. <laughs> <laughs> Almost every one of these, it depended on who the parent was or who the person who wrote the blog was or what year the science book was made in. We noticed the irony that all of our, we put the government websites way up at the top and the politicians way down at the bottom, <laughs> <laughs> just like you guys yeah. did. So when I've done this activity with kids, it's, it looks fairly similar to what happened right here. But they immediately started talking about politicians, blah, blah, you know, and Wikipedia, and oh, no, not Wikipedia, yes, Wikipedia, blah, 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 no, let's put Wikipedia down here. Um, I remember a kid saying, parent, not my parents, not with science. <laughs> um, and they tended, but what I found very interesting was that they tended to rank um, their own personal observations at the top, yeah. at the very top. Mm -hmm. And so, um, But that, here's what's interesting. So, Hadley, you trust your own observations above um, somebody who's been studying, a scientist who's been studying for 20 years? <laughs> yep. Um, but Hadley, how do you feel about Shannon's observations? Would you trust those? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. So, it was interesting. So, uh, one of our test sites did this, and then I found out later on that somebody told us that it had become a norm amongst field instructors to say, what's your source? And they realized it had become this culture of co constantly sharing, passing around these naturalist facts. And they didn't know where they'd come from. And they didn't know the veracity of each one of these statements. And they started to challenge each other, saying, what's your source? And when I've done this with kids, the same thing. What's your source? They start saying, what's your source? So these three activities, are again, are not meant to do with kids. But we're doing them with field instructors to inform, get field instructors to think more about evidence. Um, as they're dealing with evidence and to have this inform their discussions with kids but not necessarily do these activities. I have a quote that I'd like to share with you. Yes. I do science during our labs back at camp. I don't do science on my hikes because the science takes away from kids being able to appreciate nature. And this is from a program that puts a very strong value on science, by the way. What do you think is behind somebody making a statement by, like this? I think it must be somebody that doesn't really understand science or just has that very narrow view of what science is. It might be someone who's not very curious themselves, too. That they're not trying to figure out stuff, so they can't see how that would be fun to get kids to try and figure out stuff. That can scare people. If you don't think on your feet, if you don't have the tools that we ha we're being given now, then, yeah, I mean... <sighs> You don't have to conduct full-on investigations to make explanations from evidence. And you can have a rip-roar in science-y time. <laughs> <laughs> that needs to go on that. Kevin, do it. Can we do it on that? <laughs> <laughs>